Tornado GR4. 30 million pounds worth of aircraft technology in one formidable fast jet bomber. Learning how to fly it is a hard earned privilege. And for the select group of pilots and navigators who get this far, it'll be the toughest training of their career to date. This is the story of one group of Tornado GR4 students, all motivated by the same burning ambition, to successfully complete the course that could make or break their fast jet career. RAF Lossiemouth on Scotland's Moray coast, the largest and busiest fast jet base in Europe, and home to 15 Squadron, the unit responsible for teaching air crew how to fly the Tornado GR4. Squadron leader Howie Edwards is the course commander here, and has over 2,000 flying hours in the Tornado under his belt. He's pushed the aircraft to its limits in the front line in Kosovo and Gulf War II, and knows it inside out. This is my office, this is the, uh, the Tornado GR4. Um, as I say, the, uh, I think the best uh, strike aircraft the RF has. Um, designed as a low level uh, attack, uh, strike attack uh, bombing aircraft, uh, and it does that job very well. It's uh, designed initially as a, it's a supersonic um, aircraft. Uh, it's got two engines um, with reheat, so, um, which we uh, use to get airborne, because uh, we can take off uh, up to about 27 tons in weight, so it's uh, quite a bit of weight. RAF Valley in Wales. Seven junior pilots have spent the last two years here learning how to fly the Hawk training jet. Today they're travelling over 500 miles to the north of Scotland to join 15 Squadron for the end of their training. They've beaten off thousands of competitors to reach this stage. 23-year-old flying officer Gav Fryer from Dorset is the baby of the course. We just finished packing the two vans and loading up the two superb fine examples of boats here uh, to travel up to Lossie. Uh, so it's the last time for us in Wales. The pilots are on their way. Um. I think there'll be some anxiety, uh, there'll be, the pilots will be feeling some anxiety as they drive up. It's quite a long drive as well, so um, from where they're coming from, so there'll be plenty of time to reflect uh, as they drive. The course starts tomorrow, and Gav's settling into his room in the officer's mess. Flying a fast jet has been his dream for a long time. My parents are both school teachers, but my dad's always had a really big interest in aviation, and uh, he always wanted, wished he could have been a pilot, and it just rubbed off on me from day one as a kid, really, so it was, I always had a really, really keen interest in it, and it sounds kind of cheesy, but it was the only thing I really fancied doing. But how's he feeling about the big day tomorrow? Yeah, a little bit nervous, and looking forward to it more than nervous, I think. It's a frontline jet, so it's the real thing. It's an important day for the fast jet contenders of 35 main course their first day of ground school. An intensive period of classwork and simulator training they must pass before they're allowed to fly the Tornado GR4 for real. Flight Lieutenant Fraser Wood from Kukubri is the only Scot in the course. Well, we're, uh, we're just getting ready our, uh, for first warning and uh, meet at eight o'clock in the foyer. Head out in five minutes. Pretty excited. Um, but also uh, apprehensive, you know, it's, it's difficult going, you're always uh, kind of the big fish in the, uh, in the small pool on the last course and then uh, you know, going to a new base, a new course, it's all, you're always quite apprehensive, so you want to make good first impressions and all that. So. I'm excited, I'm always excited to see um, the new students meet new people anyway, that's always a good thing. Um, 
their enthusiasm and their excitement does rub off on you as well and there's nothing more rewarding than actually to be on one of their first trips, to fly one of their first night sorties, to so demonstrate what the aircraft can do. The course is quite intensive, um, starting with the ground school and uh, the learning curve just gets steeper. All right, fellas, good morning. I'm uh, Squadron Howie Edwards. I'm going to be your course commander. So, um, as per the, as the exec said, welcome to uh, 15 Squadron. Um, you're probably all quite nervous right now, sitting here thinking, what's going on? Um, you've got five weeks of ground school ahead of you, OK? Enjoy it. We've got excellent facilities. The simulators is one of the best simulators in the world, OK? I'll ask you to be prepared, OK? Uh, look ahead to what's coming up. Um, if you get an hour and 20 on a sortie, that is your classroom, OK? That's where we teach you. Um, so you need to be best prepared before you fire up the engines. Time to get up close and personal with the Tornado GR4. The standard required to get to this stage of advanced flying training is exceptionally high. But this course isn't going to be easy. If they fail to make the grade here, these students will be reassigned, possibly to administration jobs. For those who do make it, there's an uncertain future ahead on the front line. It's time to catch a glimpse of the multi-million pound virtual jet, the simulator. Would you like to go and look in the cockpit about five at a time? Feel free to get in the cockpit, please don't press the move to stop that. In two weeks' time, the students will be undertaking a series of increasingly difficult flights in this high-tech machine. Their every move monitored by instructors in the control room below. This is a real picture of what's going on in there. So if you're asleep or uh, <laughs> uh, eating a Mars bar or whatever, we can tell. It's the end of a hectic day, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. Beer call at the officer's mess. <laughs> I think it's a bit like going the first day at school, isn't it? <laughs> so we got a bit of nerves, you're a little bit excited, you want to get started and do, do some work and things, like you've got your new pencil case and things, but uh, it's, it's good just to get into some of things. Early next morning, site training manager David Bolsover is waiting to greet the fragile students. Morning. Are we well? Yeah, we're well. Cool. Oh, look, they're all drifting in. Morning. Morning. Welcome back. You didn't make it overnight? <clears throat> Just around. Good. Right. Excellent. Nav systems lecture, that'll wake them up. Sore heads or not, it's straight down to business as far as Mike is concerned. To some of you it'll be new, but at least oh, by the end it's accelerating or decelerating. This is from way Virginity. And so it goes for the rest of the week. It's time for Woodsy's first shot in the sim, and he's flying with course mate Flight Lieutenant Mark Still. Still is a veteran navigator with frontline experience flying the Tornado F3 fighter jet. That should help Woodsy in the cockpit. Sim 1 is really a run through the cockpit checks and uh, the basic procedures on the ground. When the boys finish here and go to the squadron to fly, they will need to be able to do the checks 100% correctly. It takes Woodsy and Stilly a whopping 40 minutes just to get strapped in and run through the checks. Finally, they can take off into a virtual sky. Happy to go. Yep. Check that the nozzles go to 100. 100. Good. Pony and nav instructor Jim Ross watch their every move from the control room. Yeah, good. Come on, lift it. Lift oh, it. Yeah. Flying in the simulator is incredibly realistic. The only thing it can't replicate is G-force. It's physically and mentally demanding. But in here, mistakes can never be fatal. Yeah, if you keep coming left, you'll see Elgin on your left hand o'clock. Ah, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's try and aim for 1,500 feet. Slide the throttles back, rock the left one outboard, oof, and the right one left, nose real low. There it is. They've landed successfully, but it's been a strange experience. Having visual for not moving. <laughs> Doing all the hard work. <laughs> I, I swear, anyway. So watch him, right? Right, here we go. I swear, watch him. A week after their first sim, the students are halfway through their simulator training and the heat is on. Flying officer Gav Fryer is just 23 and the baby of the group. He's flying today with Flight Lieutenant Mike Garland, known to his pals as Judy. Emergencies are rare in the GR4. 
but in Sim 6, they must learn how to handle them. Uh, we're off to practice emergencies uh, during the takeoff or after takeoff roll, and then we're going to do a bit of low level. I'm going to have to pull out a low level because the weather's going to get bad. As Gav and Judy deal with engine and hydraulic failures, something goes wrong. Is it all over the place? What's he done? What's he done? What's he done? What's going on? Just put the power up, just get a little bit of speed up. Alpha's fine, speed's fine. Uh, try lifting the flaps again, yeah? <laughs> what happens when we went flap down? Woodsy's next in turn and watches anxiously with his course mate, Rich Taylor. Yeah, all right. Just, I'm going to freeze you. This is not right, OK? Of, uh, the system. Gap, you're a disaster, uh, yeah. <laughs> The sortie is aborted so the engineers can investigate, but Judy's not so sure the computer is to blame. It's broken. Brett's in twice. Destroyed it. It was just frustrating because the sim is normally brilliant today. Had a glitch. If he hadn't a Hector, we'd quite happily have kissed the sortie off. But no, he did a good job. Outstanding. You know, I'm not going to tell him that, though. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit scary, actually. They had to have that in the real aircraft at that height, anyway. Everything was going fine one minute, and next thing, Gav appeared to have no control over the jet, which uh, I'm fairly sure isn't going to happen in real life. Coming up, Woodsy faces emergencies in the simulator. And will the final sim sort the men from the boys? RAF Lossiemouth in the northeast of Scotland. It's an important day for the fast jet contenders of 35 main course. Only one sortie in a final exam stands between the students and the controls of the Tornado GR4. But Sim 11 is the bad boy of all Sims. Woodsy and Stilly are first in the hot seats. Bottom line is, be there and cope. It's your chance to show us that you picked a thing up. It's also a great sort of check for us to make sure we've given you all the right gen. Uh, so don't go slashing your wrists if it all goes pear-shaped. Puppet masters Tony Lunnan Wood and Jim Ross will throw continual spanners in the works, introducing everything from search and rescue helicopters to engine failures along the way. It's not long before Woodsy starts to suffer from testitis. He's overloading his brain looking for faults. Yeah, still traveling, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. The guys are on tenterhooks because it's like a check ride. They're almost reading things into, you know, looking for faults everywhere. So it's. We're very careful now, it's maxing them out. Boys, you can end up flying the whole route just looking at all the gauges. You don't look at anything else, waiting for something else to happen. Okay. Woodsy and Stilly have landed too, but it's been a rocky ride. A catalogue of errors made this a touch-and-go sortie. I wouldn't say our greatest hour, but we'll wait and see. It's time to face the music. As all debris you'll find in the FOSR will neither pull punches or be dishonest. The single-engine recovery drills were red, but there was a brain fart at some point, still. Make sure one of you has got your eyes out at, at any one stage, because you can guarantee if you're going to have a midair, that's when it's going to be when both of you uh, heads in. But there's good news for the crew. Okay, you, you have passed. It's not your shiniest sortie. Yeah. It, you're yeah. flown. If you're well aware of the errors that you made, and you made a good effort of, of working as a crew. Thanks. Just, just a little bit annoying, because we, we've had some Good sims, haven't we? Yeah. And emergency sims, and then you, you come to the big one at the end and you want to do as well as you can. I don't know. <laughs> it's just annoying. It could have been better. But Definitely. Yeah. Now only an exam stands between the students and the tornado. Squadron leader Simon Tickle, known as Tess, is about to hand out the papers. Right. <laughs> It's, it's been sitting there for three weeks. So. <laughs> Unbelievable. The pass mark is high, but those who make the grade will transfer from ground school to 15 squadron to train in the tornado for real. Tess has marked their papers. Now it's the moment of truth. Right. 
putting out the misery time, isn't it? And to add a little bit of drama, we'll take it from the top. So, Mr. Cable, he got 98% and nobody else did. Mr. Wood, 93%. Still, 89%. Fryer, 89%. The pass marks 85%, but there are still some results to go. Taylor, 85%, and the final one, Lockie, 85%. <laughs> <laughs> so, They've all passed. Woodsy got the second top mark and beat his more experienced cockpit partner, Stilly. A week later and the students of 35 main course have made the move to 15 squadron. Torrential autumn rain has hit monsoon levels across Scotland. It's all adding to the drama of a monumental week. The reality is that um, they go from simulating to the real world. Um, and the real world is very unforgiving. They'll be apprehensive. Um, there will be small fish in a big pond. They'll live their lives trip by trip until they leave. Within days of arriving, the pilots are taking their first flight in the tornado. It's the sortie they've been working towards for weeks, but dreaming of for years. Flight Lieutenant Cy Whitehouse is amongst the first to fly, under the guidance of squadron boss, Wing Commander Ian Chalmers. It won't be long before his course mates follow. Gav is starting to feel the fear. I was right into the back 20 minutes ago, and now I'm nervous again. <laughs> I run out of fingernails. Literally run out of fingernails. Gab's off, and Woodsy's not far behind him. Years of hard graft, Cy, Woodsy and Gav are finally flying the Tornado GR4. A massive 20-ton ground attack bomber with a top speed of 1,000 miles an hour and up to 30,000 pounds of thrust, all under the control of three dedicated student pilots in their 20s. This deadly fast jet had its full wartime debut over Iraq in 2003. Who knows where it will take this generation of aircrew. An hour and a half later, Gav's touched down. That was wicked. Was it good? Yeah, it was really good. Welcome to the tornado, mate. Thanks very much. Great. That's good. <laughs> good, yeah. Woodsy's back on terra firma too. It was all right, yeah, take off first, you know, real take off and stuff, so it was, uh, it was brilliant. I was kind of just going down the runway, <laughs> head on fire, <laughs> trying to do all the right things, but yeah, but it was cool. It was, uh, good fun, enjoyed it. Woodsy, uh, he did quite well today. It was good for his first trip. Um, he, he didn't scare me, and we're still alive, so that's the main, main two criteria. But just a few sorties later, Woodsy's in trouble. He's got a recurring problem, and his flight today will determine his fate. The concern to us at the moment is uh, Fraser. He's been placed on PPR, which is Poor Progress Report, and that's for uh, his his seeming inability at the moment to fly a, a swept approach. If the wings get stuck back um, during flight, then you need to, you need to make a, an approach with the wings swept to land. But at the moment, you can't quite do that. To um, show problems so early on, on what is a very difficult course, with uh, the learning curve doesn't get any easier throughout the whole phase, then uh, it, it is a bit of a worry. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Woodsy's been given another chance in the air to conquer this problem. If he hasn't sorted it out this time, he'll be placed on review. And that's just a step away from the chop. Well, quite frankly, it shatters lives. I mean, if you can imagine just having everything you've ever dreamed for taken away from you in one uh, interview, then uh, that's how they feel. So it's quite um, a harrowing time for them. A month after arriving at 15 Squadron, flying officers Gav Fryer and Phil Lockie are heading out on a sortie. 
We're just desperate to get in the jet. <laughs> We're going to go flying. Today's trip marks a milestone in their training, their crew solo. It's the first time they'll fly without an instructor. Darren is overseeing the first timers. They're both flying officers. I mean, Gav looks like he's pinched the headmaster's car and nipped off, and you know, he looks like he shouldn't be here so long. It, it is, it's a big step for them. After his shaky start, Woodsy's had to work extra hard just to keep his head above water and stay on track. He's flying his crew solo with Flight Lieutenant Mark Still tomorrow. The big thing tomorrow is, obviously, yeah, if I'm, instructor, I'm not going to have any control, if I have anyway, I'm not a trained pilot. So I'll be relying on Woodsy a lot, which is how it's going to be from now on. You always knew that, you know, if, if you weren't handling it properly, you know, then there was always the option for the instructor to, to, get, to take control if you felt it was necessary. But now, um, if we are flying in a, in a strike aircraft tomorrow, then still he doesn't, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing else in the back. It's all down to, uh, down to me. In Scotland's expansive skies, Gav and Phil prove themselves as GR4 crew. From the air traffic control tower, Darren monitors their landing before heading across for the debrief. I'll see you inside then. Okay. That was good. Fun actually. Yeah, it was cool. It was very good. But we'll see how the debrief goes. That's yeah, the most important thing. We'll see what Dars thinks of our performance. Gavin Phil's crew solo today was a bit of a shambles in all. Today's story was good. It was really good. They could have rescued it if they'd have worked well as a team, but they didn't. As a team, our airmanship decisions are overall pretty good. Crew cooperation was pretty pretty awful, really. We work uh, as a team fairly well today. In eight months' time, they could be uh, over Iraq, you know, doing the job. So we can't afford to. Yeah, that's okay. Don't worry about it. To celebrate their achievement, RAF tradition marks the occasion with the solo barrel. Here, the young pilots and navigators formally receive their 15 squadron badge from their wing commander, Ian Chalmers. It's a sense of achievement for them. Uh, you know, we want them to kind of enjoy the moment because we've got a few more surprises in store for them throughout the course, but they should, they should feel pretty proud of themselves. The students have completed the first phase of their flying training and already have some special memories. But it was flying around the Western Isles with Phil in the back and uh, just, it was a gorgeous day in Scotland, there was no cloud around and we were just flying around these little islands uh, and it was a beautiful day, the sea was like a sheet of glass and I think that's probably, probably one of my best trips so far, just beating through Scotland at you know seven miles a minute, that was great. Coming up, it's bombs away for Gavin Stilly. <music> RAF Lossiemouth and the fast jet students are back at 15 Squadron, ready to start dropping bombs after their Christmas holiday. Navigator Flight Lieutenant Scott Cotton's come back a new man after marrying his fiancée Louise in Devon. It was really good, excellent. Uh, we were really lucky with the weather. Um, there's a lot of people came from sort of up here and uh, lots of family and stuff. And it was, it was really good to catch up with everyone. So that was the highlight of my, uh, well, highlight of my life. But with the bombing training underway, the honeymoon period is on hold for Dodd. Not long after his return to base, he's flying one of his first weapons sorties with squadron boss, Wing Commander Ian Chalmers. In the weapons phase, we, uh, we take the guys through the very basics of weaponeering, making sure that they understand the aircraft systems, which are pretty complex. Uh, then we make sure they understand how to drop the, the weapons in a variety of different ways, all of which are applicable to the weapons they're going to use when they get onto the front line. Using a combination of guns and, uh, and the bombs that we carry, we can uh, take out armoured convoys, uh, hardened bunkers. They need to make sure that the bombs are on target on time, and that's what we're looking at. Bombs on target on time, really, really important part of this phase. In the Tornado GR4, navigators have two roles. They don't just direct the aircraft, they have to select the weapons as well. This keeps Dot busy in the back seat. 
Um, there's a lot of checks to be done. Um, there's a lot of safety things to be aware of because obviously we want to be safe when we're in the range. Because in the back, uh, I'm working the radar, so I'm trying to get a good mark on the target, so trying to identify the targets. The bombing range is in Tain, Sutherland, two hours from Lossiemouth by car, eight minutes by jet. Dot is flying information, so there's a lot to think about. He'll have to coordinate his plans with the crews of three other jets. It's time to kick the sortie into action. Meanwhile, the youngest pilot on the course, flying officer Gav Fryer, is preparing for his final weapon sortie tomorrow, the Crew Dive 5. Gav's been forging ahead with his pilot training and his six sorties in front of Dot. It's a demanding exercise. Gav will have to dive at the targets from high angles before releasing a combination of bullets and bombs. Um, we do lots of different profiles uh, for the dive. Um, we do shallow dive, which is sort of five and ten degree. Um, we also do strafe uh, with the gun, which is great fun. And what we also do is the more dynamic maneuvers. Um, one of them is called an op 20, which is a 20 degree dive. Uh, and basically running quite fast, yank away from the target, pull up, uh, go screaming, but it grease nose up. In Tain, Dot's bombing mission is underway. But will he hit the target as far as the boss is concerned? Okay, next run is a, a lay down run, so changing to PBR one single tail. Uh, we're doing phase two on offset two and then phase three on the target. All the crews are safely back at base and in the debrief. You don't often get a force call. a good thing about your spacing in the range, making sensible adjustments to take all those lessons forward to the dive phase or for a little off. Four. And first one, we got a DH, so a, a direct hit, so that was, a, that was good. Some of the others weren't quite so good. Uh, and there's loads to, loads to come out of it, really. Um, lots of things to learn. There's a few little silly mistakes which I'll uh, have to take forward to the next trip and uh, make sure I don't mess up on those again. On the bombing range in Sutherland, Gav and Stilly are carrying out complex high dive maneuvers as they fire bullets and drop practice concrete bombs. If they ever go into combat for real, they'll be launching far more powerful weapons. By the time they leave us, they should feel confident about their ability to go on the front line and pick up laser guided weapons, uh, anti radiation missiles, storm shadow, brimstone, everything else that we have in the front line inventory nowadays. Gav and Stilly are back on the ground, but did they hit the target? No direct hits. Some close, which was good. Yeah, some not so close, which wasn't quite so good. But yeah, little things to work on, but yeah, it was good. It was good. Good fun. Tony's happy with their performance. Uh, very good, actually. I think Stilly talks a little bit too much, but uh, he's the first one to admit he does. <laughs> Uh, but apart from that, it, it worked quite smoothly. I've seen a lot of mistakes on this particular sortie and they didn't make those, which was nice to see. A future on the front line is what drives these students, but soon the tight-knit class will be split up. If they qualify from this course, they'll be posted to various squadrons, either here in Lossiemouth or RAF Marham in Norfolk. Course Commander Howie Edwards will reveal all to them at the traditional postings party. A little bit earlier in the course, they all had a dream sheet, which is um, where they wrote down where they would like to be posted, um, either a base uh, such as Lossy Mouth or Marham. There is a service need, however, and we can't satisfy all of the people all the time, so um, some of them may not get what's on their dream sheet. Despite the seriousness of the matter, there'll be fun and games at the postings party, and Howie will have a key part to play. My role at the postings party uh, will be that of the, uh, the MC, so um, I have the, uh, the answers that they require um, at the end of the postings party. So uh, as they um, fight and play their way towards um, trying to establish where they're going and if they've got what they want, um, I'll be the man giving them the yes or the no at the end of the game. The students are busy organising the games. The party will be fancy dress with a Chinese New Year theme and Sandy's in charge of making it as memorable and messy as possible. Posting party, we've uh, got a little game set up, so we've uh, sort of got it so we're all sort of sliding down something and then putting our heads through a hole to find out which squadron we're going to go to and people checking what bombs are. And if we, get the, if we get the squadron right, then we get to have a glass of champagne and celebrate. We don't have to go around and do it all again. Get wetter, get colder. Howie will be the host with the most confirming the postings to the students and their families. Uh, there will be sort of wives, partners, and I think um, uh, Flutter and Garland's um, mum and dad are going to be there, so 
Um, it'll be good to see their reactions as well, um, especially the families, because obviously they, they will finally be able to know where they're going to settle down for the next two and a half years. Everyone has their own reason for requesting a particular squadron, but there are no guarantees that they'll get what they want. They're totally in the dark about their fate, but Howie remains tight-lipped. At this stage, I can't really say it's um, held in utmost secrecy. For the past week, I've had the calls battering me, bribing me, trying to find out, uh, because I've known for a couple of weeks now. I can reveal there may be a couple of people who haven't got what they may have wished for. With no time to lose, the games begin. If you've got your head through the wrong hole, I'll give you a thumbs down. That is the order for you lot to unleash hell with a water bottle <laughs> on the head. <laughs> if, however, you get the right squadron, the one that you wanted, uh, or sorry, the one that uh, you're actually going to, really you'll get a thumbs up. And uh, Tarzi, my lovely assistant, will give you a uh, custard pie in the face and you'll receive a glass of champagne. Watch and shoot. Steady, go! It's already a war zone. Flight Lieutenant Mike Garland is first in the firing line. His mum and dad watch anxiously. Nine Squadron in Marham. <laughs> He's got what he wanted. Woodsy. That's an oak. That's a water bomb. <laughs> Woodsy will have to try again. <laughs> Woodsy aims for another of the Marham squadrons. As the other students get the postings they ask for, Woodsy aims for a third Marham squadron and gets it. Like Stilly, Gav wants to join the damn busting 617 squadron. That's where it's going. Yeah. <laughs> there are two navigators left in the running, Phil and Stilly. They both want to stay in Lossiemouth for family reasons. It's the moment of truth. Will Stilly and his wife get what they want? Yes. After exhausting all the lossy mouth options, dad to be Phil is forced to try 31 Squadron in Marham. His wife Laura watches nervously, but it's not looking good. Wish to stay at lossy mouth as I'm established in married quarters. Congratulations, 31 Squadron! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you it anyway. Oh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. You can try straight Cheers, fella. All right, cool. Mate. All the best. Cheers, fella. Thank you very much. How do I look? You're looking good. You're good for a man. Mate, we're going to have an awesome... I think uh, I put my head through the 12 squadron hole and then the 14 squadron hole, and then I uh, kind of realised that we were going to Mora. <laughs> But uh, no, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm quite happy with that. It's, it's all right. Um, yeah. We're, yeah. <laughs> the students head off to change into their costumes. Most of them are delighted with their postings. <laughs> I'm going to 617, which is great. Really neat. It's my first choice squadron, so yeah, wonderful. I'm going tomorrow, which is where I wanted to go, so I'm really excited. So yes, it's spot on. Yeah, first choice. Really, really happy. So yeah, we get to stay up here. It, it's brilliant. I got very wet during the game and, uh, and also cost covered in, uh, in cream. And I, uh, I've been posted to uh, Marham and uh, in 13 squadron, so I'm, uh, I'm well chuffed over the moon. Excuse me, uh, Natasha's coming off. Coming up, the all important night sorties begin. One of the most exhilarating things I've ever done in the Toronto University. It was really, really good. RAF Lossiemouth. The pilots and navigators are knuckling down to a crucial phase of their course, night flying. In combat, bombing missions usually take place under the cover of darkness. To do this confidently and at low level means putting their trust completely in the jet's autopilot technology. These first night sorties can be terrifying. I've done night flying before, but I've never been at low level. 
and it's a, it's a very different environment. Mainly because we're flying at 500 feet close to a lot of granite and we can't see it. So we're tr trusting entirely on the smart bit of silicon in the jet to, uh, uh, to keep us barreling around at low level and not hit anything. It's an unsettling experience for the instructors too, but for different reasons. With the knife flying, um, one of the hardest things for us is that uh, for the pilot's first trips, we're sat in the back. You haven't got the best view in the back at night. So as an instructor, it's an anxious time for a new pilot doing his first landing at night in a tornado. That's uh, certainly one that we, uh, we don't look forward to. Judy and Sandy are flying their low-level night sortie over the Scottish Glens, but bombing missions in the dead of night have been a chilling reality for squadron leader Howie Edwards. In Gulf War II, he found himself a split second from death when his tornado was attacked by a surface-to-air missile, or SAM. The horrifying incident was captured on the jet's in-flight recorder. There were situations that were quite uh, hairy out there. Uh, certainly on my first night mission we were fired at uh, by SAM-3 uh, and also my formation leader as well. So um, we weren't relaxed when we weren't sitting on our laurels um, and we certainly paid the, uh, the enemy the respect it was due. Judy's back on base. It was awesome. Just about one of the most exhilarating things I've ever done in the tornado, actually. It was really, really good. You couldn't really see much out the windows, obviously, because it was dark, but just occasionally you'd see a, a house or a mast go past the window. They've fought off thousands of fast jet hopefuls to get this far, but success isn't guaranteed even at this late stage. Course Commander Howie Edwards from 15 Squadron, the tornado training unit, has been actively overseeing their progress. But before they reach the finish line, the pressure is ramped up to new highs. The SAP and the OP phase of the course are the most important two phases. They're at the end of the course um, because they uh, basically condense all of their training that have been given from day one uh, into uh, making the transition from operating the aeroplane, or flying the aeroplane, sorry, into operating it uh, as a weapon. Uh, and it's the last trips I'll do before they'll move on to the front line uh, and use the aircraft for real. Well, at the moment, we're just planning for a, our first heavyweight weapon drop, so uh, we'll be dropping one thousand pound uh, weapon. Now, I say weapon; it's actually full of sand and concrete, so it simulates a thousand uh, pound bomb. Up till now, we've been dropping uh, fairly small, three or fourteen kilogram bombs, and now this one suddenly weighs about five hundred kilos. So uh, clearly, the jet accelerates a bit, a bit slower, and, uh, and handles a bit differently. The mission is well underway. Pocket two, quite hot. Pocket one scored five four to two four. Pocket three scored six nine at three thirty. Completing the SAP-4 bombing mission will take these four pilots and navigators a step closer to the final and most challenging sortie of the course, the OP-5. On completion of an OP-5, it's the OCU giving them our stamp of authority and them being released to the front line for use in combat. The four ship has touched down. But how did it feel to release the thousand pound bomb? It's awesome, yeah. It's obviously a, a bigger thud than the, uh, than the three kg coming off, so yeah, it felt, uh, felt pretty cool. It was good fun. Made a big thunk when it came off, which was uh, quite impressive. You could feel it coming off the jet, which really makes you know you, you've done something. The following day, Gav and Stilly suffer a major blow. They failed their penultimate sortie. Pretty good. I think pretty. both of us are really annoyed by ourselves at the moment. Mm. There's an error on our part, and it was an error that can be avoided. Uh, it's a lesson now, though, so 
doubly annoying to get this far on the course and have done really well right up to the last two trips. The following morning, Howie decides the crew must be placed on poor performance report, or PPR, for critical mistakes. They won't be allowed to fly today. Well, the situation is um, Gav and Steady were due to refly their OP4 uh, today. Um, unfortunately, uh, last night after we looked at the video, um, some more things came to light and uh, we've had to ground them today. Um, there were some uh, quite bad decisions made uh, during their uh, sortie. So it essentially ended up with two aircraft running towards a target at about the same time, which is obviously a dangerous thing. Uh, and the, uh, the staff uh, um, spotted this and uh, took their aircraft away from the, uh, the target. Um, that was a timing error um, put in by the backseater, but the other errors really were their fuel management uh, when they recovered to uh, RAF Lossy Mouth. They were, uh, they were not as sharp as they could have been with uh, the way that they uh, handled their recovery back here. So, uh, and that's the reason they've been put on PPR. Uh, you fly as a team, you train as a team, uh, and you, um, you stand up and face the music as a team. After being grounded for a day, they've flown and passed their reset. But as they embark on the crew OP5, the final training sortie before moving on to a frontline squadron, their recent fail is uppermost in their minds. Is that what you're saying? It's going to work that way if we come that way. And then we're done aside here, we'll be good with the SF because we've still got a 90 degree perpendicular turn as we come in, so we haven't got a collateral problem. The lines have been drawn in the sand and they realise what they have to achieve, so they will be anxious, notwithstanding the in fact, it's their last trip anyway. We'll uh, cross our fingers and hope that they uh, produce the goods today. In a third jet, Howie and Flight Lieutenant Tim McCauley will play the role of a foreign aggressor. We'll probably attack them a couple of times before they get to their first target to give them a timing problem. Uh, and then after that, we'll just try and run them out of fuel. Stilly and Gav are ready to do battle. Uh, Howie's the bad guy. <laughs> I'm ready to try and avoid him if possible. It's not over till it's over, pretty much, so... Uh... Big match mentality. Go out, do the job to the best of our ability, and uh, basically prove we can do it. 250 feet above the sea, it's time for Howie and Tim to make a surprise attack on Gav and Stilly's two ship. Right, they are. Right, two o'clock low, tally one. Actually, the player's bandit, one, two, six, twenty-two, cross star, tally pair. Right underneath, yep, got them. They must outmaneuver Howie in the enemy aircraft without getting hit. It's a modern day dogfight, utilizing all the GR4's capabilities. Right, he's running away, good man. A flat! Alright, 210. You'll see, TK. Flat! And it's still on you. Can you flare it? A flat! After an hour and a half of gruelling exercises testing their mental capacity to the limit, Gav and Stilly touch down. But with their confidence dented after their recent fail, they are not convinced that they've done enough to pass, and they are unhappy with their performance. Instructors get together but give nothing away. Gav and Stilly have to sit through a tough hour long debrief before the verdict is known. Uh, from the safety side, yeah, uh, we sat for 30 miles there in, uh, in cloud, so just get on the radar advisory service, especially again not switching off towards the end of the trip all the way through to the end. So that is a point there. At last, the, they get the news uh, they've been waiting for. Well handled on the, um, on the uh, debrief of the evasion side of the house. So certainly as far as I'm concerned on this trip, for you, the war is over. Howie? Yeah, congratulations, OP5, Amarindam. Thank you very much, sir. Good luck on 617. Well, Amazing, it's going up. Thank you, sir. 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 After five years of intensive training costing millions of pounds, Gav and 
Delhi have secured their future on a frontline squadron. They are now fully qualified Tornado GR4 aircrew. I just thought we failed. Convinced we'd failed. We'd done really well to like the most of the stages of the course and then we hit our stumbling block on up four. Well, now we're going to go and celebrate and uh, I'm going to buy Stilly a pint. Uh, and, and I'm then... not going to buy Gavin because I've got a wife and children and oh, I can't afford that. All the students are delighted with their success and where the trailblazers lead, the others follow. For Flight Lieutenant Fraser Wood, successfully completing the course just a week after High Flyers Gavin Stilly is especially sweet. I came here wanting to do as well as I could, and I have done as well as I'd hoped. We've known each other a long time, we've been through a lot together, um, and obviously a few of the guys are going to stay up here on squadron, so it'll be a shame, uh, a shame that we won't see them as much. It's been a monumental journey in a monumental fast jet bomber, and incredibly, not one of the students has failed to complete the course. Uh, I'm quite proud, really, to see these, uh, these young men turn into uh, young junior pilots and junior navigators who uh, I'm quite pleased to say I'll be more than happy to have in a four ship going out on operations. And I thought, yep, yeah, I'd happy have you on my wing if we went out into uh, conflict. The perils ahead facing these guys, what's around the corner, I just don't know. And, and I think that's part of it. No one really knows what's going to happen next. I know that it's, uh, should the situation arise, that they face what I face, then uh, they will cope. Now, the real work is about to begin. Cover in Pushing Daisies, that's next on STV. Then at 11 o'clock, it's the late news. And at 11.35, our late movie is The Truth About Charlie. And check out our Watch to Win question. It's on the way.